You are listening to the Logbook Project podcast, and we appreciate you tuning in. The Logbook Project is a global journey of a World War II pilot's logbook, collecting first-hand accounts of veterans, witnesses, and victims from all sides of this horrific conflict. The project is intended as a token of remembrance and education to raise awareness of the sacrifices made. We encourage you to learn more about our project at our website, thelogbookproject.com. Welcome to this episode of the Logbook Project Podcast. My name is Lars McKee, talking to you from Sweden. And as we've grown accustomed to by now from his tropical paradise of St. Lucia, project founder Nick DeVoe. How are you doing this morning, Nick? I'm good, Lars. Uh, it's your afternoon, my morning. I think that's something that we need to remind folks that we have a five-hour difference. And, uh, and as we go along with the project, it's going to get more interesting as we try to pull people in from around the world. But yes, <laughs> I'm good. it's good, good to be here. <laughs> Yeah, most certainly. So just before we continue our journey now to illuminate some of the incredible legacies of our signatories, I just wanted to say that if you wish to learn more about our project, what we do, why we do it, and how we do it, we encourage you to please tune in to our first introductory episode where we explain this in a little more detail. But on today's episode, we will be talking about a veteran who participated in what has been hailed as the greatest raid of all. The formal code name was Operation Chariot, but most will recognize it as the Raid of Saint Nazir. And I simply cannot make an introduction that does justice to the legacy of Major General Coram Perdon of Number 12 Commando, British Army. And uh, on that bombshell, I will hand over to you, Nick, and ask how you came to obtain Mr. Perdon's signature. So this one, I've been, I've been sort of chomping at the bit to get to because this story today could occupy, uh, I think you and I have discussed a series of podcasts. Uh, this is a story that just keeps on giving it, you know, it, it's almost a, a pity that the backdrop of all of this is World War II because this thing is scripted to be like a whole Marvel superhero series. Uh, <laughs> when I first heard about this story, it, it almost transports, well, certainly for me, uh, it transports me out of the realm of World War II into the into the realm of science fiction. This story has everything that you could ask for in terms of you know just just the bravery, the planning, the impossibility of the the target, the characters involved. It's it's a made for movie package, and in fact there is, there are hopes to eventually make it into a movie. But sadly, of course, the context of all of this is World War II and the horrendous uh, the tragedies and the loss that, that inevitably occurred. So what is this all about? Um, you, so when we last left our hero, and I guess our hero in this case is going to be the logbook every time, right? Yes. Um, Mr. Mori had signed. And as I mentioned, at that moment, my eyes were just opened to, you know, stories from every single quarter. And at the time, and of course, this whole thing has unfolded very organically. I, you know, I was completely green. I just became a sponge for stories at that moment. And, and my immediate way of finding stories was based on other interests that I had at the time. So one of the things, and some people hate him, some people love him, uh, is a gentleman, kind of controversial gentleman. But he, the man is a genius when it comes to television content, uh, Jeremy Clarkson. Jeremy Clarkson, of course, is from Top Gear, which then went on to become the Grand Tour. And most recently, his series called Clarkson's Farm, absolutely engaging, um, you know, where he, he bought a farm and then he just, he, his life every day on, on his farm there in England. And it's absolutely fascinating, I think. But Jeremy Clarkson is also a man steeped in World War II history. And I think his own father-in-law may be a recipient of a Victoria Cross, if I have that right. But anyway, so that was, like I say, a natural, uh, something that I was naturally interested in anyway. And it turned out he did a documentary called The Greatest Raid. And so I, you know, naturally I just began to watch that. And then this story begins to unfold. And and it's, it's a great documentary. And I would encourage our listeners to, to check it out sometime. It's on YouTube. You can just Google it. I begin to watch this story. And at the end of it all, I start to then sort of Google's, you know, I, one lead leads to another, which eventually took us to a, a gentleman named James Dorian, who is 
a central person in the in the writing and study of this story, which which we will also get to. And the basic premise is this: in 1942, with the Battle of the Atlantic raging, uh, there was serious concern about a German battleship called the Tirpitz, and Tirpitz. Uh, it was a monstrous battleship that the Germans had built. A sister ship to Bismarck. Right, correct. A massive thing. It was it just, just a juggernaut. Um, the, the range of the guns on this thing was, what, was it 15 or 30 miles? I mean, this thing was just, it was monstrous. So this vessel, you know, they were worried that had this thing gotten into the Atlantic, it would, it would, it would, create even more havoc with the shipping, which of course was so critical to England's survival at the time. And there was already enough concern about what the U-boats were doing to the shipping at the time. From Britain's point of view, that was a lifeline, right? Without that, without the supplies coming over from America, Britain's war would have, would have wrapped up quickly. So it was absolutely critical that this, this be maintained. And I think also this was at a period in time when the Central Atlantic was beyond the scope of air cover for the Allies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the convoys coming over, were, that was a real point of weakness and risk for them. So they could not allow this ship to go and get into the Atlantic and, and start causing problems there. The other thing about this was that the only dry dock large enough to accommodate Tirpitz in the Atlantic theater was based in eastern France, in Saint-Nazaire, uh, in a massive dry dock facility that existed uh, a couple miles in this big river estuary that goes up uh, where the the french had built this this huge dry dock facility it was the only one in on that on that seaboard that could could uh, service a ship of two pits size in the event you know inevitably that it would need such maintenance during the course of the war historians will immediately recall the, the story of the bismarck Bismarck, when she was sunk, well, first she was damaged, but the, the damaged Bismarck was actually heading for the dry dock in St. Nazir for repairs when she was sunk. And the conclusion after that was that this dry dock in St. Nazir needed to be taken out. Sure. The conclusion was that if the dock in St. Nazir was unavailable, Germans were unlikely to risk sending the turpits into the Atlantic. They could. She was up in Norway, but they didn't send her out in the Atlantic because they were afraid that if she got damaged, she would have to run the gauntlet into German harbors through Denmark Straits. So yes. that's why she just, you know, became a, a cannon battery up in the Norway fjords. Right. And, and Clarkson actually does a really good job of explaining that in the documentary. And was that post the encounter with HMS Hood? Yeah, was that was good? after. Yeah, right. So, I mean, so she blew up Hood and then was hunted down and right. damaged. And when she was damaged, she, she sent her, her escort on to proceed independently while she was heading for St. Nazir for repairs. That was the only big, the place that she could be repaired. But obviously the, the Brits caught up with her and sunk her. Right. And that, yeah, that's another famous battle because I think the yeah. rudder was put out of commission and the Bismarck yeah. could only turn in circles and then eventually they closed in and sunk. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. These things are important because, and, and in fact, in some way, it may have even focused the Brits' attention on the dry dock in St. Nazaire. As you, as you mentioned, if the Bismarck was headed there, then it probably re-emphasized for the Allies, or at least yeah. the church anyway. And then the appreciation that, look, we really have to do something about this facility. So... So the facility itself is, is an impressive, it's really a, a massive sea fort. Uh, right next to it, you have these U-boat pens where the submarines were, were housed. Uh, and and, and they, these consist of bunkers built over, this, over the water, massive concrete reinforced things. Uh, you had several German armored divisions, of course, in the town of St. Nazaire defending the city. You had all sorts of um, heavy artillery, along the coast there. So a real 40, reinforced, fortified German military base is what St. Nazaire essentially was. It had 5,000 men right. deployed in that yes. area. In, in, <laughs> um, so how then to, to attack and how to, to decommission this thing permanently in such a way that it would really be out of service? I mean, the odds were, it was a mount, it was a huge challenge, right? So hopefully we've, we've explained 
how difficult this was going to be. Bombing was going to be uh, almost impossible just because the accuracy was so off at that time. You didn't have anything like guided precision missiles. And very often, uh, targets could be missed by as much as five miles. So, uh, and again, what you were trying to do is decommission the, the gate of this, this dry dock. And the gate itself was this massive steel barrier. I mean, it was huge, but you know, the odds of hitting a direct hit or enough sufficiently to damage it from the air, I don't know how many thousands feet up. It was just, it was just not going to be on. So then enter this hatch, this plan to, to send in commandos to do it. And to do it by through land would have been equally challenging. As you already mentioned, there are 5,000 garrison troops in and around the area. So the next thing they hatched was to say, all right, let's see if we could do this by sea. And then who and how, right? So there were sort of two, two bits to this plan were, were conceived at the same time. One was the actual implement of destruction, if you will. And they came up with this idea to take a, a ship and pack the bow full of explosives. And they figured, all right, if we could somehow ram this ship into this massive steel dock, without it exploding on impact, but somehow devise a timing fuse that would then detonate and then blow up the gate. I and mean, so, so you would remove now the, the challenge of accuracy, because obviously this thing is, is indeed a guided missile by, by human hands anyway, uh, and ram it in. So that was one part of the theory. The next part of the, of the exercise was finding the, the individuals to pull this off and, and along with damaging the gate. They also wanted to wreck all the infrastructure that supported the actual yeah. dock itself, which included pump houses, and stuff. Pump yeah. houses that, that, yeah, that were responsible for lifting and lowering this gate, right? So they figured the more damage they could do to the whole dry dock infrastructure, the better the chances of this thing remaining out of commission. So of course that was therefore going to involve persons to be able to deploy again, in a very uh, strategic way to get down into these pump houses and, and really blow them up with, with timed explosives and so on. So they figured out the, the what, I guess we could say, and then it was a question of the who. And so enter, enter now a bunch of, uh, this was this, they realized, okay, we're going to need a force of very, very special individuals to pull this off. The, the, geez, the, the individuals would have to be incredibly fit brave, motivated, intelligent, and problem solvers. And when you put those things together, especially the, the motivated and pro problem solving part, you, you start to run into qualities that are not necessarily good army material in the sense that in the armed forces at the basic level, infantry level, the, the theory is always that you, you want to bring in impressionable minds and, and shape them into this, this fighting force who follow orders at, at, at the entry level of the, of the army. That's, that's what you're after. But what in this instance was needed for the job were these very sort of intellectual, very creative uh, persons who, when faced with a, with a task that could go a myriad of different ways with the, with the things that could go wrong, had to be able to overcome and think and, and move on the fly. And so this alone is fascinating in terms of, in terms of how the, the training and, um, uh, and, and the, the psyche the, in these men that were selected is, yeah. <laughs> the, and of course, when you think of the traditional British with, you know, the, the, their whole sort of system, their systems of, of and government and the army, which is so regimented. And along comes this group, which was basically the, the precursors to the commandos. It completely butted heads with the establishment, you know, the military establishment in, in, in England at the time. Uh, these, so they gathered up these men and they started the training, who obviously came from regular army units. And one such individual was this gentleman named Koran Pudan and a host of others and, and their backgrounds were varied. And, but the one thing they did all have in common was this, as I say, this thing about incredibly intelligent, very motivated, uh, uh, very strong, capable human beings and thrown together, but their, their training methods. Uh, so they focus a lot on the fitness aspect of it. Of course, hand-to-hand -hand combat, 
they were they were true soldiers in that sense. Um, this was not going to be any sort of cakewalk. They had to be, yeah, they had to be literally physically fit superhuman uh, type characters. And they, they, their training regimen was as difficult and as hard as anything that you can, you know, uh, akin to your Navy SEALs and your Green Berets and all the other special ops forces you can think of. Um, mm -hmm. But they were not regular military in the sense that they didn't have barracks. I think they, they would be billeted in people's homes around the place. Um, and, and of course, this rubbed, this rubbed the army the wrong way. The army was not enamored with these gentlemen at all. At the same time, they, they had the support from Churchill and I guess a, a couple other. They must have had, you know, the support from from the, the right persons to make this thing happen. Obviously, I, you know that. So that was in terms of who these men were and how many of them were. Uh, are we talking about? It's like two hundred fifty of them or thereabouts. Two two hundred sixty five commandos were fielded on the day of the operations. Three hundred forty six okay. Royal Navy and two hundred sixty five commandos. 611 okay. men in total. Wow. So it's a, it's a sizable force, right? Yeah. Um, and then you had the actual apparatus of the, of the of the attack itself. And what they did was they got a World War I destroyer. It was called the Campbelltown. They made some modifications to the vessel. This was going to be this was going to be the strike vessel. And the idea was they packed a whole set of explosives up into the bow of this this boat they then had to devise a timing switch so that it would not explode on impact uh, so this was going to be the main strike force the tip the spear tip right and then in support of that you had a bunch of smaller uh, uh i guess what they were called pt boats perhaps these were these were much you know yeah. fast wooden and this is key wooden vessels i think they're about 50 to 60 feet long these were the support vessels that were going to carry some troops. And the idea was that these, these smaller vessels and packed with fuel because they had to get there and get back. Um, and these vessels were going to come in support, drop off the, re the remaining commandos, execute the plan, blow up the pump houses, do whatever else they needed to do, rendezvous, hop back onto these support vessels. Because obviously the Campbelltown was, was going to be expended. Everybody was going to jump back onto these wooden boats and then tear out uh, back to England. Uh, that This was the plan. And of course, the... Can I just ask you something, Nick? Can you just yeah, sure. imagine the room when somebody hatches this plan hey let's just fill the bow of a world war one destroyer filled with explosives and we'll just run it up this <laughs> dock doors yeah and... But it was, yeah and that would have been fine if the when i say fine in quotes right that would have been one thing had dry dock had been right sort of along the coast you know sort of like a sort of like a d-day where you're just storming a beach that's that's presented yeah. to you flat on the normandy coast this is not the situation with operation chariot as as is your real official name uh because the whole facility resided in an estuary but this is like going five miles up this estuary so you're actually heading up into this this essentially a river with again we mentioned about the german fortifications so you've got all sorts of artillery uh, emplacements going up this thing on either side, right? Oh yeah, the Germans had it well defended with kill zones, etc. That was exactly. devised specifically to stop any incoming ships or any attack. So it was well defended, very well defended. And you can imagine, all like you say, kill zones, cross points of fire from both sides. And so part of this was going to have to be incorporated into this plan was actually an element of disguise yes because they it had to be they had to fool the germans now into believing that these were uh friendly forces Just, you know hmm. happily cruising up this 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 estuary uh, so as not to draw fire on themselves but of course being completely exposed and once exposed they could be certain that every single gun would be trained on them uh, so this was what was presented to them and there's a wonderful scene in the documentary where Clarkson goes through it step by step. And at the end of it, he takes a pause and he goes, right. And, but that's, that is the kind of thinking. So here is this <laughs> impossible plan. I mean, it was just the goal of coming up with this was, the, you know, insane. And yet going back to the mindset of these commandos, they were enough inspired, motivated 
and of course with the with the benefits of youth you know cocky enough to believe that yeah we're going to go and pull this off you know so that that is in you, essence you, you got to remember sorry to interrupt you got to remember this is march 1942 they departed from UK and had to go into the Bay of Biscay and then into this place. So just getting there, getting there is just no less than a suicide mission in Correct. itself. Getting there. America has only, you know, been officially in this war since December. Just so just what, three, four months earlier. Um, yeah. So and the Americans are very much on the back foot. They are in no way really prepared for full out war. Uh, so they're, you know, uh, Everything about this mission was was slated to fail. Uh, it was really against all odds that they even hatched this mm. plan. So off they go. Uh, and then there's some other important characters that we do need to mention. Like, for instance, the gentleman who devised the switch, I think he wrote to his wife afterwards saying that he probably, he figured this would be, he would not see her again. He didn't think he was going to come back. So, I mean, some of, some of the Navy staff of this mission were under no illusions, you know, they, they appreciated the full risk of this. Uh, some of them even wrote to their family saying that they didn't think they were going to come back. And in fact, that did, did play out. But off these men went, um, they had, so they, they, they disguised the Campbelltown to look like a, an old German uh, ship as well. They, 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 they cut some of the funnels, they made a few modifications to the boats so that they, uh, and of course, they had to time everything so that they, they did it on the right tide. The estuary was full of shifting shoals and so on. And they had to make sure that the bloody thing didn't get uh, grounded as they were heading up um, into this. As Well, as you mentioned, it was you had to pass through the Bay of Biscay. And then the, the estuary sort of sits kind of, I think, sort of halfway up that, that French coastline. There. Um, of course, they were going to do it at night. Now, anyone... Anyone who has a, a maritime background will appreciate, you know, I live on an island. I used to fish quite a bit and I had a, I had a boat at one point. And it always was amazing to me. We'd go out fishing in the, in the afternoon. It was still light. But then heading back, it would be dark. And navigating at sea in the dark, even today in this, you know, 2024, is such a completely different experience to, to being at sea in the day you know there are no signposts you know everything looks different you you have to know your markers on land you have to rely on what navigational aids may be around so doing things at night in a vessel in peacetime conditions requires your focus it requires your attention because you can get lost you can you can run into something it is comp you know just so that is an appreciation that I have. And so when you now, when you turbocharge this into, <laughs> into a war zone, heading up into this estuary where you first of all have to navigate for whatever shoals may be there. And then, and then understanding that at any moment, all of these various uh, artillery nests could open up on you where you're trying to find a target that, yeah, you've seen the maps, but now here it is, you're in real time. And you, you, you know, I mean, I could not imagine the focus, the goal, the, the, I mean, just pulling that up, like just to go and do that today in peacetime would be an achievement without, without the threat of being blown. Under blacked out conditions and so on, which you would have, have assumed. Exactly. Um, and it, it, it wasn't a matter, it wasn't a case of if we're going to be made out, it was a question of when. But amazingly enough, oh, and then here's the other thing. They decided that they would, in fact, send up some bombers to go and, and bomb in the vicinity to try to get the Germans to be looking skyward and take the attention off, you know, the water approach. So this happened. They did send up um, some squadrons. But what it actually ended up doing was raising the general alertness of the Germans that something was amiss. And so, so this, this Operation Chariot sails into this. And, um, it, and it, be, it worked for a while. They actually did, they had a big uh, sw swastika flag that they flew. And, uh, and yeah, they had the benefit. I mean, I suppose the same 
risks of darkness actually did play into their advantage in the initial stage of the approach because none the, the Germans did not open fire. But at some point along the route, well before they arrived, somebody something clicked and the guns opened up from the shore batteries. And then it was complete mayhem. So they are now being shelled. And not only are they being shelled, but they're being shelled with a massive bomb in the bow of the boat, which, I mean, again, I know nothing of explosives, but if I was on a ship and I knew the entire bow was packed with explosives and all of a sudden I'm being fired upon, I would not have a warm, fuzzy feeling in my stomach. I, I mean, that just adds <laughs> to the whole tension. Right. The and the the explosives were actually encased in in concrete for that fact, but correct. you know a direct hit from a high, high caliber shore battery. You know, it's you it's know, at the moment when everything that's on shore is pumping lead in your direction, hot you know steaming hot lead. Uh, you know, I'm I'm not. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> So it, it's just, it's complete mayhem, right? And and the, the boats are being fired on, the Campbellton is being fired on, um, but it does not dissuade them. They, and, and again, the captain of that vessel, he stays the course. He absolutely stays the course and they continue to navigate. And again, at that moment, any slight shift in, in direction, any miscue of understanding exactly where you were, would have landed them up in a wrong spot, right? Yeah. But they sailed through this hail of gunfire. Uh, we, well, we haven't even spoken about our main signatory, Koran Pudun. So Koran was one of the commandos and he was aboard the Campbelltown. And his job, him and a small team were tasked, once they arrived at the dock, they was tasked with jumping off the Campbelltown running to one of the, the dock houses, the wheel houses, and their job was to pack explosives into it and blow it up. He's aboard the Campbellton, and he you can go online and watch videos of him speaking about, he said in one instance, uh, a shell came and just punctured right through the ship, went in one side and comes out the other. And you can, there are photographs, you can look uh, and see the damage to the ship before it exploded where you see the kind of impact from these shore batteries. I mean, it, it was horrendous. And of course, they're, they're sustaining hits. Some of the guys are, you know, wounded and bleeding and, and dying on Campbelltown. The, the wooden boats were, did much worse, much, much worse. Because of this, this structure, the very structure being wood, and because they were packed up with drums of fuel, they just became floating bombs. And several of them just, began to explode in a, in a huge fireball. Of course, Roman fuel, candle has been mentioned. Yeah, Roman candle. Fuel pouring out all over the water, men falling into the water and just, I mean, dying the most horrendous of death. In fact, uh, some of the others who they interviewed afterwards spoke about the haunting screams of these men as they just, they just died in a fiery <laughs> grave. I mean, horrendous, horrendous. But back aboard the Campbellton, None of the hits that it was taken took the engine out and they continued to steam ahead. And again, I cannot wrap my head around the courage and the incredible, uh, the incredible skill of the captain to find the dry dock and ram the ship straight up into the middle of it. I mean, it was a, it was a bullseye of, of unimaginable skill. It really was. Even as I sit here and speak to you about it, I, I you know, yeah. imagine now being on the Campbellton, people are shooting at you and yes, you're going to drive this thing and hit the dock. So there's a, there's an impact that you sort of have to brace for, but also, as you see, they really didn't know if the timing switch and the explosives were really going to behave that way. They designed it and the theory was there, hmm. but they really didn't know if on impact, the whole bloody thing wouldn't just go up. So on top of all of this, on top of everybody trying to kill you, you don't know if really what you are doing here is a complete, you know, suicide kamikaze type mission, right? You have to <laughs> hope and pray that the engineers figure this thing out, but you really don't know. And yet the impact that this thing obviously hit the, 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 the steel gate with was obviously full bore throttle, everything that Campbellton could muster at that point. I mean, the ship really ran straight up into the, 
the top part of the gate. And, and apparently, as soon as the ship runs up and hits the, the gate of the dock, the captain turns to one of the gentlemen next to him and says, right, there we are. I think they were about three minutes late. So, <laughs> you know, this, uh, I mean, mind-blowing. Anyway, so there's no, there's no breaking out of champagne at that moment. They're still being fired on. Um, Koran Pudan and, and, and his team and the other teams who, are, who could still function scramble off. They, get, they have to get off this thing now with, with whatever ladders they had. And they they run into the town to their various targets, the wheelhouses, which presumably could not not have been too far away. No, um, it was adjacent to the dock, but right. But still, whatever ground troops uh, all under fire, right? And they get oh, yeah, there. This is a full out ground, ground battle. Yeah, absolutely. There's a full out war going on now, and the, the 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 door, of course, is locked and. Somebody pulls out a pistol. I think it was Koran himself and tries to shoot the thing and the bu bullet ricochets and, and misses one of one of those in his unit. And, the, and the, the younger guy turns to him and says, so I was prepared to be killed by, you know, the Germans. I really wasn't, <laughs> didn't come here to be shot by you. Some comment like that. <laughs> they, they blow it open and they run down, they pack their explosives in and they, they turn around and get out of there. And of course they have to go down a whole bunch of stairs. It's not just like, you know, oh, let's just throw a grenade. This was a very, they then had to go down into the guts of this wheelhouse, right? Pack the explosives, turn around, get back out of there. And sure enough, they, they achieved their target. They blew that wheelhouse up. By which time, of course, the idea then was to rendezvous with these, with these wooden boats and get out. But those wooden boats, well, we, we've already described the carnage that was being visited on them. Um, so any, any hopes of, of being able to rendezvous at the point that they had established, that was just shot. Uh, the mission at that point just sort of completely falls apart with those who are on shore. Uh, and this, again, is where the, the, you know, the part we were stressing about earlier in terms of the thinking and, and the, the cunning of these men. They now have to, they're presented with a whole different set of circumstances, which they have to try and figure out for themselves. But they're on their own, basically. And so they end up in a shootout. Uh, some of them, of course, get killed. And by next morning it became obvious that they were going to have to surrender. Back at sea, the couple vessels that did not get blown up had to beat a retreat. And um, I think one, I think there were a few that actually made it all the way back to England, but they were much, much... Yeah, there were quite a few that actually made it back. The tally in terms of casualties is uh, there were 169 killed in the raid mm -hmm. and 215 were taken as POWs. Right. Uh, that's 384. Uh, that 63% of who left was right. either dead or captured. Right. So, which, given the odds of this thing, is is um is probably even is probably even better than expected. You know, in terms of. <laughs> I, I was just thinking that because even that I just said a 63%. That was probably better than than expected. Yeah. How horrible that may even sound. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I mean, it was a death. The whole mission was a suicide mission. Yeah. I mean, they you could know, have she, not have expected to, to come back. I mean, at, you know, somebody looking at this from a, a risk management point of view would have said, well, yeah, you could easily expect 80, 85, 90% casualties easily. Right. Um, so 65 in the, in the scheme of things, you know, from a mathematical point of view is, is good, but there's a human I aspect. Even Mr. Perdon was, uh, he was injured in, in the battle as well. I think it took a, well, twice actually. I think it took a, some shrapnel from a hand grenade or something. He, he was injured during the, the, the battle anyway, but continued right. to lead his, his group. Absolutely. So they end up housed in, in, a, in a room somewhere and um, yeah, they, end, they had to surrender in the end. And there's footage. One of the quirks of this is that the Germans actually had a film crew that had come into St. Nazaire that, around that same time. They were there to do a propaganda film. So when, when this thing all started to play out, the next day, of course, the film crew was on hand. And they were there are some incredible images. Again, you can Google this and you can see the Germans rounding up the POWs, um, putting them onto trucks. Some, some of them were really busted up. And, of course... Back to what we were talking earlier. So the ship is resting precariously on this on this massive steel dock gate. And the Germans were actually quite bemused with the whole thing. They thought, 
wow, that was uh, that was pretty balls. You know, that really took some gumption. And they were actually quite impressed with what the British had had dared to attempt, not understanding, of course, that what the ultimate goal was. They had no idea that the power of this thing was packed with explosives. So again, there are images of Germans crawling all over Campbellton, taking um, trophies, taking little, um, you know, uh, tokens of this ship because they recognized that it was such a, a, an amazing uh, mission. And so the Germans are uh, basically parading the POWs around and showing them the ship and saying, you know, you know, gents, that was, that was pretty brave. But as you can see, you really haven't achieved anything. You've damaged the top of the gate, but it's certainly by no means is it out of commission and we'll have this thing up and running in no time, you know. Of course, the commandos just sort of sit in there biding their time because they know that at any moment this thing is supposed to blow up. I think they had arranged for it based on the timing switch. It was supposed to go off at, a, I want to say somewhere around 10 a.m. in the morning, but I'm not sure about that. But whatever the appointed hour was, it came and went without any explosion. And so that you can imagine there must have been some period of just, you know, anxiety, appreh apprehension in, in, in the guys' minds, thinking, gosh, I hope this was all for, for something. I hope this wasn't all for naught. Um, but within that same day, I think, and I think I want to say somewhere around midday, but, uh, but don't quote me on that, um, the thing explodes in a mighty explosion that destroys the gate and causes a rush of water to come up, you know, into the dry dock and, and, and washes what is left of the Campbellton into this dry dock. And there's some photographs of that. And the Campbellton looks like, a, you know, a rag, a rag doll was left of it. And it's interesting because when you look at those pictures, Campbellton is so tiny within the this, this gaping dry it's dock. Just gonna say, it's massive. That dock is just massive. I mean, that whole destroyer just looks like a little, just a small piece of wreckage on the bottom. Yeah. Yes, it doesn't even, it's not even recognizable as a ship. It just looks like, as you see, just some kind of leftover machinery. <laughs> um, but the dock, the, this massive gate is in fact blown to bits. And of course, everybody aboard the ship, all the Germans aboard the ship uh, are gone as well. And the the incredible thing is that that dry dock remained out of commission for the duration of the war. It wasn't fixed until after the war. So Koran Padan and, and the other POWs, they go to, uh, you can tell me the name of the, the place. Koran Padan ends up in Uflag 9A uh, POW camp. Um, and then, but he stays there for a while. And then later on, he, towards well, the end of the war. He stays there until he escapes. <laughs> right. If, and uh, he ends, then he's captured, but then after he's captured, he's moved to Kolditz Castle. Kolditz, uh, that's the one I yeah. was looking at, which that has its own story. Towards the end of the war, uh, Koran joins up with some unit. What he does, yeah. he's, he's in Kolditz Castle, and as Kolditz Castle is liberated by the American forces in April 1945, Koran Perdon is not just content with being liberated. He actually joins the American forces. <laughs> and continues fighting as one of the American subunits and until he's returned to Colditz for repatriation back to the UK. So, yeah, he escaped from Uflag 9 once and then was captured and brought back to Uflag 9, I believe, but then was caught digging a tunnel a second time. And at that point, he was moved to Colditz Castle, which was probably regarded as more of a high, higher security. It's okay. How in the world did you come to obtain Mr. Perdon's <laughs> right. signature. So, so, you know, let's go back to rewind a little bit. To, the book is in Japan. Shigiyaki Mori has signed the book. I become totally enthralled with all things World War II. I'm turbocharged now. And up comes this documentary about the greatest raid hosted yeah. by Jack Coxon. I was like, okay, I have to get somebody from this thing to, to sign. And of course, anytime a big story comes across my radar, even up to today, the number one question that we want to ask is, are they still alive? Is anybody still alive? Is this person still alive? Because, you know, that's, that's the initial thing. And it always breaks my heart when I read about a story through an obituary instead of a current report. But anyway, so this thing pops up and I'm like, wow, you know, who could I find? And so I started to dig a little into the background of the documentary. 
and this name uh, James Dorian comes up. And James James is really the keeper of the historical flame of the, the greatest raid. He's Irish, but he was living in Canada at the time. And even how he became aware of the story would be an interesting discussion. But, but he did, and he just devoted his life to the research and telling of the story. He, in fact, he moved from Canada back to, to Europe to really immerse himself in this story. And over a period of several years, James interviewed, oh gosh, I don't know how many, but it was- Oh, the, I, very, very many. I mean, many as okay. were alive and that would speak to him, James devoted his life to, to engaging with these men, getting their stories. And, and over this time, he became very close to probably several of them, but two in particular, one was Mr. Koran Padan, and the other one was a gentleman by the name of Mickey Bourne. And Mickey's story within this is, has even more intrigue when you start to delve into Mickey's background, who he was, the flamboyant character that he was. Uh, yeah, that in itself would take another podcast. And, and I encourage people just to, just to Google Mickey Bourne and see what you get. Um, and James and Mickey be, became very, very close. In fact, I think James described it as a father-son relationship to me. Um, James spoke at Mickey's funeral James still has several original documents from Mickey. So James, of course, becomes integral into the, and he's written several books about the raid. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that actually, ironically, or maybe not ironically, the logbook right now is at James Dorian's home. Uh, James, we've asked him to sign on behalf of Mickey Bourne because of their, as I mentioned, their, their close relationship. And so James, again, has been a wealth of knowledge and support to us in, in our ability to tell this story. And I had the, the privilege of being able to speak to him a couple of weeks ago. So we may insert a little bit of, the, of that conversation here. I have said somewhere on something I wrote that um, if I had wanted someone to share a foxhole with while under fire, it would have been Corley Purden. He had this kind of um, steadiness and confidence that you require in people that you are fighting with, yeah. or fighting alongside. He is uh, very much, although he's Northern Irish, he was very much the quintessential British gentleman. You could not have wished for a better person to meet. He really is an authority in understanding the, the, the true story of the St. Nazaire Raid. And he was the lead consultant with uh, Jeremy Clarkson's documentary as well. So thank you, James, if you can hear this. Thank you so much for all your support. Uh, so I reached out to James. And, and remember, I have one signature in the book. I have a track record of one. And I reach out to James Dorian, and I am a complete unknown. Um, you know, anytime people... In I'm going to say the first will get calls from little Caribbean countries and so on. They immediately think they're trying to be swindled somehow. Uh, there's a lot of suspicion that goes with it generally. And somehow I managed to convince James that my intentions were above board and that I just simply would love to get an, a signature in this book. And James agreed. He said, yeah, he could venture to introduce me to Mr. Koran Pudan. And of course, when I began to read Koran's profile and that he was on the Campbelltown and this is what he had to do, I was, I mean, it was a no brainer. At the time, being the, the last of Cyril Debo's 10 children, it means I have an extended family. Uh, our family network is huge. In fact, we're having a family reunion um, this July in Tobago. And I think the head count is about 90. So we will be probably doubling the size of Tobago overnight when we all arrive, but that's for another show. Um, so as a result, at the time, one of my nephews, Daniel Dibault, he had been relocated with the company he works for, and he was based in England. So again, I had, I had a safe harbor, at least to send the book to, and I explained to Daniel what I was trying to achieve. And he said, sure, send the book over. And he would, you know, he would assist me in getting it to James and Mr. Perdon. And at the time when I, when I had caught up with James, they were in discussions about creating a script for a movie. And like I say, this thing, this whole story was just written to be produced as a movie. And so there was some fundraisers that they were hoping to have. And the idea was that one of these fundraisers 
was going to take place and Mr. Padan would be there. And James agreed that he would receive the book presented to James at this fundraiser and hopefully he would sign it there. But of course, and this has happened multiple times, because it started this project so late, Koran Padan is a man who was in his 90s and, and the vagaries of health, right? In fact, he did not attend. And, but so we, the first thing was we sent the book off from Japan to England. And of course, I was so excited, right? Because I thought, oh my gosh, you know, here I am fresh off of the success of Mr. Mr. Mori signing in Japan. And, and wow, this actually looks like it's going to work a second time. Like, you know, I, <laughs> it's, a real th- it, it's still a real thrill. But of course, with absolutely no experience, no track record, like I said, to speak of. Um, anyway, it was just, it was, I was buzzing. I really was. And uh, so Daniel gets the book. As I say, the idea was to have Mr. Padan sign, and it, but that did not happen. He was not well, he could not attend. And so then we had to kind of say, okay, well, how could we make this happen? And then, because, you know, you, have, you can't just barge into people's lives. You know, they're in their 90s, they're not well. They, you know, who are you? What is this all about? Again, why should I even take you on? So you have to really tiptoe around their health situation and whatever is going on in their lives at the time. And the other thing then uh, is that Mr. Padan's eyes, this man was actually awaiting surgery on his eyes because he, his vision was being severely impaired at this time. Uh, and yet, and yet, despite all of that, agreed that he would receive the book at home. If we sent the book to his home, that he would sign it. But the surgery was being scheduled in this time period. So I, uh, I think we had to, just trying to think now, if, if we got it done before or maybe just after the surgery, but it was around this time. Anyway, Daniel mailed the book with James acting as the interlocutor, if I can use that word. It was agreed that the book would be sent over to the Padon household. His wife at the time had agreed, I guess, to assist. The book was received and something that developed early on, uh, I send a letter. There's a letter that I type up to each veteran, which introduces a brief introduction of who I am and a little paragraph about recognizing the individual service or whatever they may have witnessed. And then a final paragraph that uh, asking for their signature and explaining to them that this is really something that we look to honor their service and and record their story, their contribution. So that letter went with the book. The Padons received it. And Mr. Padon signed, he signed the book. And his eyesight was such that, you know, his handwriting, you can see that he's struggling with his handwriting. But just the fact that this man sat with the book and wrote, now, this podcast is, is just audio for now, but eventually we will sort of insert photos and so on. So right here, if you're watching this on YouTube, we will stick up his actual signature. And Mr. Padon received the book and with his, with his failing eyesight wrote, he didn't just sign it, you know, like Mr. Mori had just signed it. And, and I mean, I, you know, this is not a competition or anything. I, I didn't give instructions. I never give instructions of what to write. But this gentleman at his stage of life, sat with the book and wrote, with my best wishes, Quran Padan, on the 5th of August, 2016. And you have to understand the heroism in just, just doing something as simple as that, that he, would, that he would actually engage with me, a complete stranger, and do that. And then along with that, when he sent the book back to Daniel, he, he wrote a letter and one of the few documents that we have received, I don't expect any anything other than the signature when I send the book to the signatories. But again, this gentleman's sense of duty, his sense of recognition, you know, he, he sat down, I guess he narrated, I imagine his wife is the one who probably typed it out, but he also signed it. And the book came back to Daniel with this letter. Uh, it remains one of the very treasured among many, I should say, but it, re- it really, re- it has a special place in the logbook project. This letter written, written to Daniel because Daniel was the one who sent it to him after all, and that's fine. What blew me away was that he acknowledges my father's service. He says, your father did his part. And you know, I, you know, 
my father never went into combat. But I mean, my father, I certainly have a whole appreciation that I never had before this project of what my dad did. But in no way would I, and I know my father also, would never try to equate his service story with someone of the caliber of Koran Pudan or any of the men who went on this raid. In no way. It just doesn't match. And it'd be foolish to even try to attempt that. But hey, again, you have Koran Pudan writing me a letter recognizing my father's service. So that for me was like, that was really humbling. It showed the, uh, the, the tremendous wisdom of this man to see the, the contribution that, that it took on all, at, at all levels, you know, for people to come together and, and defeat the tyranny of Nazism. And the book and the letter were returned to Daniel. And there it was, there it was. We, you know, we had pulled off, pulled it off again. And as I say, it's dated August of 2016, just a few short weeks after having the book in Japan. So here I had these two signatures. And I mean, with that, with that under my belt, it just became, you know, the project was now turbocharged as far as I was concerned. I mean, I, I, I can only encourage listeners to, to check out the documentary, The Greatest Raid, or just, just Google it, you know, whatever source of material you find online. It's a fascinating read, uh, what they were able to achieve. Of course, Tupitz, therefore, never did get into the Atlantic. It remained in one of the fjords in Norway. It was eventually sunk. And we will get to that down the road with the log broken. We, we will get to that down the road because there's a con yeah. very, very tangible link uh, further on in yeah. the project. Yeah. One of the gentlemen who was involved in the, in the death raid for the Tupits is a signatory to the logbook, as is one of the gentlemen, one of the, the uh, Luftwaffe gentlemen, whose job it was to defend the Tupits. And, you know, we will get to that. We will, anybody hearing my voice knows anything, has any interesting angles about the greatest raid. Maybe you had a relative, maybe whatever. But, you know, again, we would love to hear from you. We would love to hear your insights. There's never an angle of this that we would not be interested in. And in fact, as you, as you alluded to, Lars, the connections, uh, we will see in, in later episodes how these same submarine pens that were up and down that Bay of Biscay coast, how they, in fact, eventually began to impact the Caribbean right here where I live. And we will get to that story down the road with the Operation Newland and what happened here in, in 1942 and a little bit of 43. So, so stay with us, stay with us as it'll be down the road, but we will get to that, uh, which is another interesting thing coming out of this project, which I never considered in the beginning was how the stories of, and the theaters that the signatories are associated with began to link up over time. But, but that's for another show, we will get there. So that in a nutshell is the story of the greatest raid, James Dorian, Koran Pudan, we keep on. I would just like to connect back to what you just said and how it all links together, because unbeknownst to you, I've not even introduced you to the idea, but we're going to make an interactive map to be published on a website where we, after each episode that we now publish, we'll drop some pins of locations, which is relating to subject witness or the veteran of the episode that we just listened to, maybe okay. two or three of them per veteran is still an idea and a development. So in, in the case of Coran Perdon, I would uh, actually say that the Normandy dock in St. Nazir would obviously be one of the pins. Another one would be off Log 9, the POW camp, perhaps also the Colditz Castle. Yeah. So uh, we encourage you to come and see our website, thelogbookproject.com, where you will be able to see this map right after this episode as it's been published on our next episode. I think we're heading to a gentleman that has very close ties to, well, it's back in your neck of the woods, isn't it? Well, Wilford Sidney Knox. That's right. We can, so because from there, then Daniel brought the book with him down to Trinidad. So at that point, the book was sort of leading the way in terms of where, who and how. And somehow I was aware that Mr. Knox was a, a World War II veteran. So I just thought, right, that would be a natural progression. And yes, we will delve into his his minute by comparison to the, the story of the greatest read, but every bit as insane, <laughs> his civic oh, story. Most <laughs> definitely. Yeah. That was so a on that bombshell, we should probably <laughs> conclude this episode and we hope that you will continue to journey with us as we continue to illuminate the uh, legacies of our veterans. So until next episode, I'll uh, just say thank you and bye-bye. Uh, 
Bye. You have just listened to an episode of the Logbook Project podcast, a non-profit initiative seeking to illuminate and preserve some of the veteran legacies of World War II. To contact us or obtain more information about our project, please visit our website, thelogbookproject.com. We would love to hear from you and thank you for listening.